This is a revision video for the GCSE chemistry topic of collision theory. If you're taking AQA GCSE chemistry or combined science, then this comes up as part of the sixth unit, the rate and extent of chemical change, which is examined in paper two. In this video, we're going to focus on the five ways you can speed up a chemical reaction and why each one of them works. In this video, we're going to define the rate of reaction and briefly look at how we can calculate it. Define collision theory, recall five factors that will influence the rate of reaction, and then use collision theory to explain why each one of those five factors influences the rate. In case you weren't sure, the rate of a reaction is its speed, and we can calculate it numerically by looking at the mass or volume of a reactant being used up, or the mass or volume of a product being made, and divide either of those numbers by the time taken for that reaction. In order to explain why the rate of reaction changes, we need to use something called collision theory. Collision theory is the idea that in a chemical reaction, the particles won't react unless they collide, which means bang into each other, and unless they have a minimum amount of energy, which is called the activation energy. On an energy profile diagram, the activation energy is represented by the height of the hump. It's the energy that needs to be absorbed by the reactant particles in order to break their bonds so that the atoms are free to form new ones. You show it with an arrow that goes from the height of the reactants up to the peak, which is where the atoms are in their transition state. Here we can see those particles moving randomly until they collide, and if they have enough energy, react. In order to increase the rate of reaction, we need to either increase the number of collisions or increase the energy of the particles so that more of the collisions that do happen are successful. There are five different factors that we can manipulate in order to increase the rate of reaction. Concentration, which applies to solutions. Substances are dissolved in water. Pressure, which applies to reactions that involve gases. Surface area, which applies to reactions that involve solids. And then temperature and catalysts, which apply to all chemical reactions. You need to remember this list of five, as you may be asked to suggest a way to speed up a particular chemical reaction. I like to remember these using a mnemonic, but I need them in a slightly different order. The first school you went to was a primary school. P is for primary, P is for pressure. The second school you went to was a secondary school, S for surface area. Next year, you might be going to sixth form, but you might be going to college, CO for college, CO for concentration. After college, you'll go on and have a career, CA for career, CA for catalyst. And at the end of your career, you're going to be tired. Primary, secondary, college, career, tired. Pressure, surface area, concentration, catalyst, temperature. Concentration and pressure are very similar, so we're going to look at them together. They both represent the number of particles in a fixed volume. The only difference is that when we're talking about concentration, we mean the number of particles of a chemical that are dissolved in water, whereas when we're talking about a gas, those are the number of particles just in an empty space. We can see the impact of concentration on rate of reaction quite clearly by doing two reactions which are identical apart from the concentration of acid involved. Here on the left I have some 0.5 molar hydrochloric acid and on the right some 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid and to both tubes I'm adding the same mass of calcium carbonate or marble chips. As you can see the more concentrated acid reacts much much faster. For reactions involving solutions or gases as the concentration or the pressure is increased the rate of reaction increases. This is because there are now more particles in the same volume or you could think of it as the same number of particles in a smaller volume. Therefore, collisions will happen more frequently. It's really important that you say more frequently, or more often, or more times per second, not just more. It's a little bit like speed. Usain Bolt could run 100 metres, and I could run 10,000 metres, but I haven't run faster than he has because I've done it in a much longer time. To get your head around why concentration can affect the rate of reaction, imagine it like this. If we took your science class and asked them to run around the school hall, it would be quite easy to do that without banging into anyone. But if they tried it in a regular classroom or in a lift, then it would be much more likely that two people, representing two particles, would collide. The third factor that we can manipulate to influence rate of reaction is surface area. Imagine the squares here represent pieces of magnesium that have been placed in acid. The acid can only react with the edges of each magnesium square. The atoms on the inside of the square are protected by the other magnesium atoms around them. The acid can't get to them. 
By cutting the big square into four smaller squares, I open up the centre of the magnesium. The acid particles can collide with it more frequently. As I cut the larger square up, each smaller piece obviously has a smaller surface area than my original big square, but if I add up the four smaller squares, their surface area together is much bigger than the one original piece. In fact, if you take a cube and cut each side in half to make eight smaller cubes, you double the surface area, but the volume stays the same. Here's a demonstration of how surface area can affect the rate of reaction. I've got two samples of magnesium here, a piece of solid magnesium ribbon and some magnesium that has been ground up into a fine powder. The powder has got a much bigger surface area. Even though each individual particle has a small surface area, when I put them all together, they've got a bigger surface area and they still weigh the same amount as my one piece of magnesium ribbon. Now we know that magnesium is quite reactive and so if I heat it up using a Bunsen burner, it will react with oxygen from the atmosphere quite readily. After a little while, I see a bright white light and some white magnesium oxide is formed. Now if I take my powder, because it has a bigger surface area, it reacts much quicker. Far more interesting. For a more traditional example of the impact of surface area on rate of reaction, we can return to that reaction using the calcium carbonate chips and the acid. Here I've used 0.5 molar hydrochloric acid for both tubes, but as you can see, the smaller pieces of calcium carbonate are reacting much faster than the one single piece, even though both tubes contain the same mass of calcium carbonate. Here's an example of a typical two-mark exam question. Describe and explain the impact of increasing surface area on rate of reaction. Increasing the surface area increases the rate of reaction, and the reason for that is that the particles collide more frequently. Again, it's really important that you're saying frequently or often or more times per second, not just more. Exam papers often include questions that ask you to interpret a graph in order to answer a question about rates of reaction. In this experiment, the same mass of large, medium and small marble chips have been placed in some acid so that they release carbon dioxide. Which line represents which reaction? The red line is the small chips. I can tell because the reaction is fastest. And I know that the reaction is fastest because if I look at the graphs, the steepest line is the fastest reaction. If I took a particular time point, like 60 seconds, I can see that within those 60 seconds, the small chips have released maybe 42 centimetres cubed of gas, whereas the medium chips have only released around 30 centimetres cubed. And the blue chips, the largest chips, haven't even released 20 centimetres cubed. The fourth way that we can increase the rate of a reaction is by increasing its temperature. The three previous ways we've talked about all worked in the same way, by increasing the number of collisions. But for temperature, there's also an additional step. So to begin with, increasing the temperature will make the particles move faster because we're giving them thermal energy, which they then use as kinetic energy. Therefore, they collide more frequently. There are more collisions happening every second. However, the extra thing is that every particle has more energy and therefore more of them have that minimum energy requirement to react, the activation energy. Here's another way that I can visualize the same concept. Within a solution, I have thousands of particles, but here I'm just showing six of them. And you can see that they all have slightly different amounts of energy, which is completely normal. There's a fixed amount of energy that we call the activation energy that they need to have in order to react. So in this particular example, three of my particles have got enough energy to react. And if they collide, something will happen, but the other three don't have enough energy. And if they were to collide, the particles would just bounce off each other and there would be no reaction. So you can see here the three that are reacting I've made green. Now if I were to heat up that solution, I would give every single particle slightly more energy and my graph might look like this. Now you can see that the particles that could already react can still react. And some of the ones that didn't have enough energy still don't have enough energy. But there's one particle that before didn't make the threshold and now did. So now instead of half of my particles being able to react when they collide, two thirds of them can. And that's going to increase the frequency of successful collisions. That's collisions that actually result in a chemical reaction. I can demonstrate the effect of temperature on rate of reaction quite easily using some hot and cold water and some glow sticks. 
my glow sticks are the same colour to make this a fair test, so that's my control variable, and then I've got some hot water and some cold water. So my glow sticks are now glowing, but I'm going to turn the lights out just to make this a little bit easier to see. I put one glow stick into the hot water and one into the cold water. And if you look at the bits that are actually in the water rather than poking out the top, the one on the right is glowing brighter because the particles have got more energy. Now, just to prove that this isn't just a better glow stick, I'm going to swap them over. It takes a little while for the hot one to cool down and the cool one to heat up, but you can see that again, the one on the right is giving out more light. And that shows me that the reaction that's happening with that glow stick is occurring faster. Here's an example of a reaction that you may have done in school. We often use this one for the required practical where you're looking at the impact of concentration because it's a nice example of a reaction which uses turbidity, which means cloudiness. But it's also a really good example of the impact of temperature. It's not a named reaction in your specification, so you're not supposed to know all of the details, but you might be asked to figure them out in the exam. So if you've seen the reaction already, you're at an advantage. In this reaction, I mix hydrochloric acid together with sodium thiosulfate. And when I do that, the products are going to make the solution go cloudy. So eventually a little X I've drawn will disappear. In this example, I've put those chemicals into a water bath, which is just made out of a takeaway container that's filled with hot or cold water. So it's going to change the temperature of the reactants. In any reaction that involves a change in temperature, you're expected to know that you should be using a thermometer to measure that. And you may be asked in the exam to take a reading from a thermometer. So you need to be looking at the green line in the middle, although obviously in your exam it will be black and white, and using the numbers on the side to work out what the temperature is. In this example, the temperature is 16 degrees C. As soon as I've added the hydrochloric acid to the sodium thiosulfate using the pipette, I need to start the stop clock and then watch the cross from above to see when it disappears. Of course, the cross isn't actually going anywhere. It's just being hidden from view by this solid sulfur precipitate. In the exam, you might be asked about reactions you've never met before and asked why they're going cloudy. And it's always because a solid is being formed. This will be shown in the chemical symbol equation using a little S in brackets, which stands for solid. At the end of the reaction, so much solid sulfur has been made that I can no longer see the cross and I need to stop the clock. Then I would repeat this reaction using different temperatures to see what the impact of changing temperature was on rate of reaction. One of the big issues with this experiment is that it's not strictly objective. I'm not making a measurement and saying, oh, well, when half a gram of sulphur has been made, then I'll stop the clock. It's all down to my own personal eyesight and judgment. So one way that I could improve this experiment would be using a light sensor rather than using human judgment. In a question about this reaction, you could easily also be asked some working scientifically questions. So these are the things that stretch across biology and chemistry and physics and assess, do you know how to do good science? So you might be asked to identify some variables. Can you identify the independent, dependent and control variables for this reaction? Pause the video and write down some ideas now. The independent variable is the thing that we are changing in this experiment. So when we repeated it, we did it at a different temperature. So my independent variable is the temperature of the reaction. When I change the independent variable, I then measure the dependent variable. So I changed the temperature and what I measured or observed was how long did it take for that reaction to finish. So that's my dependent variable. The control variables are the things I'm keeping the same between repeats to make this valid. Or when you were in primary school, you might have called it a fair test. So between each reaction, I need to be using the same volume of the solutions and also the same concentration of the solutions. Finally, from this list of five, we need to know that many chemical reactions can be sped up by using a catalyst. A catalyst is a chemical that speeds up the rate of reaction without being used up or changed. At the end of the reaction, we get it back in the same form that we had it at the start. Enzymes are an example of a biological catalyst. This means a catalyst made by a living thing and they're made from protein. All catalysts work by providing an alternative pathway that has a lower activation energy. That sounds a bit complicated, but it's actually quite straightforward to explain. Imagine that you were going to go on a trip to visit your friend 
and that trip involved you walking over a mountain. Walking over the mountain takes quite a lot of energy. That's our activation energy. Now there's nothing that I can do to make that trip over the mountain take less energy. Mountain climbing just takes a lot of energy. But it would take me less energy if instead of going over the mountain, I took an alternative path. If I had a shortcut that went round the bottom of the mountain. That's basically what catalysts are doing. They're providing an alternative pathway that requires less energy to use. At the start of the video, we looked at energy profiles and we said that the activation energy could be represented by an arrow that went from the height of the reactants up to the transition state. When you use a catalyst, the reactants start with the same amount of energy and the products finish with the same amount of energy, but the activation energy is smaller. This means that the height of the hump will be lower and our activation energy arrow is also smaller. We've already used this graph to represent particles that can and can't react. Here you can see again that I have three particles that do have the activation energy and then three that don't. My three green particles are able to successfully collide and react, but the red particles are not. If I add a catalyst to this reaction, I don't change the amount of energy that each particle has but now an extra fourth particle that before didn't have the activation energy does because the activation energy is lower. In this experiment, we're going to look at how effective three different catalysts are. In each tube, I have a small amount of hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which you can buy to bleach your hair before you dye it or clean swimming pools with. Over time, it naturally decomposes to make water and oxygen gas. A small amount of washing up liquid will stabilise the bubbles for long enough for us to measure them. You can see here that this is just happening naturally. I'm getting a very few, very small bubbles in each tube. I've got three different catalysts to add to the three different tubes. Some apple, some yeast and a chemical catalyst. The apple and yeast both contain a biological catalyst, an enzyme called catalase. Manganese dioxide is a chemical catalyst that will also speed up the decomposition of the peroxide. If you've seen the elephant's toothpaste demo, then that uses another catalyst called potassium iodide. Remember that in each instance, the catalyst is going to speed up the rate of reaction, but it's still the same reaction happening, just faster. Each tube contains the same amount of hydrogen peroxide and washing up liquid. Let's see which one of these is the best catalyst. Hopefully you're now feeling confident in explaining how and why each of these five factors influences the rate of reaction using collision theory. Thank you very much for watching and if you did find this video useful don't forget to like and press the subscribe button below.